Hey everybody, welcome to The Briefing Room on ABC's Devin Dwyer, joined by our senior congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce. Great to have you, Mary, Good to here, be here on a Monday. Uh, we're still trying to make sense of that political earthquake that has happened in Virginia, where the governor uh, over the weekend held that extraordinary press conference on the heels of that revelation on Friday of that picture, racist picture, in his medical school yearbook. Uh, it is the top talker in this town, Virginia, a critical political bellwether, swing state for presidential years, Mary, and, uh, and yet, He's still digging in. He's he, still governor today. Right now, he is not going anywhere yet. For now, he's made very clear that he thinks he needs more time to, to mull over his next move. But, but Devin, just the drumbeat, the calls for him to go are tremendous, especially from his own party, leaders of his own party saying, this is not a question. They essentially have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to bigotry. That that this that he has to step down and step down immediately. But he is is doing no such thing, and it's just really hard to imagine, given the huge, tremendous mounting pressure, how he's going to survive the rest of this day, the rest of this week, the rest of his term. Yeah, he, he we do know that he has spent the morning huddled with his senior advisors down in Richmond, the state capital of Virginia, and just a short time ago, the lieutenant governor, uh, Justin Fairfax, a good friend of Graham Northam's, uh, came out, answered some questions. He has been one of the few who has not called on Northam to resign. Here's a little bit about what he had to say. Take a listen. And I believe that the governor has to make the decisions in the best interest of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it was a very short bite there, but he basically mm -hmm. said, again, after repeating the statement uh, over the weekend, he thinks that the governor should be the one to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Of course, he would assume power if Gov uh, Graham Northam yeah. steps he's down. He's in a bit of a tricky spot there, right? He's trying to respond to these allegations, but not make it look like he's necessarily, you know, putting himself into that, that role either. What's so remarkable here about the way that Northam has, has played his response to this is that now he's say, denying that he was in that photo at all that's raised so much controversy in that old yearbook of his, but he's also uh, admitting Admitted in some ways to, to darkening his skin using shoe polish, as he said over the weekend, uh, to, 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 as he was dressing up like Michael Jackson during a dance contest, in trying to. to address these issues, he's really been digging himself even further deeper into a political Yeah, that was the here. shocker over the weekend. Our Zachary Keish has been covering the story all weekend long. He was at the press conference with Graham Northam. He joins us now in the briefing room, Zachary. Uh, but what was the reaction there when the governor volunteered that he had at one time tried putting uh, shoe polish on his face and then, as everybody's been talking mm -hmm. about, even seemed to attempt to want to do the moonwalk? Mm. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. You know, that press conference on Saturday was bizarre. You know, on Friday when this when this uh, photo came out uh, and the, the governor accepted responsibility, he acknowledged that some, some, some mistakes had been made. The big question was, which one was he? And then we went into that press conference with kind of some chatter around the idea that he was doing an about face from that. And... Uh, it was fascinating. He 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 used this this uh, this storyline uh, about how he had talked to friends and family. He had talked to even some classmates to come to the determination that he was not the person in that photo. And then he he talked about the fact that he actually had, uh, as you mentioned, used blackface, some shoe polish. He he did this kind of gesture, like he was putting on his face and and kind of took a walk down memory lane. Talked about going to San Antonio and and competing in this dance competition with his white glove and his shoes. And it, it was just fascinating. Uh, one reporter did ask the question that you mentioned, can you still moonwalk? It seemed kind of like a, a really uh, a question out of right field and maybe even a little appropriate to some. But the governor took the bait. I mean, he, he looked in front of him and, 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 and you really got the sense there uh, that he was going to go for it until he uh, looked at his wife and uh, she kind of called it off, said it was inappropriate. And Zachary, you've been doing some reporting outside the state house there today. There have been protests there. Um, for those who don't know, the governor of Virginia is a single term uh, under the state's constitution. So Graham Northam is not up for re-election. Um, a single four-year term. He was just elected, so he has some time left. And so far, though, Zachary, there haven't been a chorus of calls to try to impeach him. There's really been a lot of pressure for him to do this on his own, right? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the overwhelming uh, 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 cry from his own party to, to step down, right? I talked to somebody yesterday here, part of the Congressional Black Caucus, who told me, uh, I wish he, he would have done this on Saturday. I, I expected that he would have done the right thing on Saturday. Uh, you also mentioned the protesters. We talked to a number of protesters out here. And the protesters that I've talked to, most of them voted for him. Most of them voted for him under uh, the promise and the hope that he could be some Somebody that could drive this state forward and bring people together. And, and they're now asking for him, as you mentioned, to step aside with the hope that Justin Fairfax, the lieutenant governor, obviously a young black man who's Ivy uh, School educated, and uh, should I note, uh, the descendant of slaves, uh, in, in a weird uh, kind of irony or poetic justice here, that he could be the one. Uh, if the governor steps down, uh, the lieutenant governor could be, would be the person to uh, fill in for him. Thanks, Zachary. And in contrast to some of those uh, protesters, Mary, we've also been hearing from a handful of people who are defending Graham North. And one of them uh, joins us now, Pastor Steve Peacock from Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, is one who's gone public, spoke to the New York Times, had a, uh, had, a big, um, had a big profile in the New York Times today and talked a little bit about wanting to give the governor a second chance. Pastor Peacock, thank you so much for joining us. What, give us bring us back to Friday afternoon. What went through your mind? when you first saw that picture surface? When I first saw that picture, of course it was a, a disturbing picture. Um, but, you know, this thing is bigger than uh, just that, and it's bigger than the governor. Uh, it, this is a international and a national crisis that we have that is facing us. But I do want to point out something about that picture. When I look at that picture, I do see um, uh, things that kind of remind me of of my younger years. But after seeing that picture, I thought on the other side of this picture uh, that the governor, the governor is a good man. The, the governor, this thing happened when he was young, age 25. And I understand that people make changes in their life. I made changes in my life and my life totally changed. So saying the governor still thinks that way, I, I can't say that the governor uh, still feels that way. This is a, he's a good man. I've, I've spoken with him over the telephone. Uh, I felt his heart and um, I, I do have emotions. And I've learned a few things about this governor. This governor has uh, spent 35 years of service to uh, his country, served in the military. He is a good man. He rushed to apologize. And that's a big thing for me. He apologized. And what I love about that is that we don't want to discredit a good man for something he'd done when he was uh, 25 years old. And I think that we should all have a heart to forgive those who have done things. People do change. And that's what we need to uh, make known uh, uh, to our general public, especially in the state of Virginia. The state of Virginia is a good state. We've come a long ways. And I've seen many changes. And this governor has really served us well. But that picture, I know it's disturbing, but do, we can do, get... Pa Pastor, do you believe that, do you believe his denials, um, that the, the, do, you, do you truly believe that that was not him in that image and it's simply an accident that that, that, that appeared there in the first place? Well, I, you know what, I, I really, um, my personal uh, thoughts on that, uh, I don't even know if the governor knew that it was going into the uh, book. I, I don't, that I don't know. However, um, if it was one, if one of those persons in that picture was him, uh, okay, he was 25 years old. Let's say he's 25 years old. That was something he did then. And we can't hold somebody to that. If Look at the years of service. I mean, this, this gentleman, his cabinet is diverse. He is an advocate of uh, health care. Um, he's dedicated so many uh, years, uh, committed to people. Uh, to me, uh, the, that picture, yes, it is disturbing right now, but I believe that after all of those years that the governor has paid uh, his service to this uh, great state of Virginia, I think we should allow him to stay in office and, re and let him repent of what he did if he did do it.
Pastor, we, we've been hearing that this overwhelming, growing chorus from so many, even from uh, Northam's own party, saying that he has to go. What is your message to them, and why do you think so many have been so quick to call for him to step down? Um, yeah, I think it's because of uh, what they gather from the photos uh, in the yearbook. Um, but you see, uh, of course they're going to ask him to resign, but that's easy to do that's easy to say but when if he resigned we are still going to have the same issues that we've had for many years so i would like the governor to stand his ground and say listen i'm coming forward and i'm going to tell you that i'm in this picture and if he's not in this picture he can make that clear to us the general public and say please forgive me for that time that's what i was thinking that was my culture that was what uh, I was raised up on, and I'm asking this station to forgive me and move on. And I think that if we can have, as a country and as a state, if we can have forgiveness in our heart, because if you remove a good man from office, what is that going to do? I mean, we have a we have an international and national issue here. Well, it, as some might say, it would send a, a pretty strong message of uh, that you don't tolerate the, those sorts of behaviors uh, at the age of 25 when he allegedly did uh, did that. But certainly, as you say, Pastor Peacock, you make a good argument for for forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. It resonates with a lot of people in your state, and we appreciate you uh, bringing that here in the briefing room. Really appreciate your time, sir. Yes. Yeah. And thank, uh, thanks to him and our thanks to Zachary Keish as well for his reporting. Much more coming up on World News Prime. Uh, interesting to see if he survives the day. We do know that the drama is still unfolding in Richmond, Virginia, yeah. so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Mary, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the president giving uh, quite an interview to uh, <laughs> on Super Bowl Sunday yesterday. And I think the biggest headline of the whole thing had to do with the deployment of U.S. Yeah. troops, not just to the southern border, of which there are more going uh, to the southern border, but also over to, to Iraq. What are you hearing on the Hill well, in reaction to that I, comment? I think the president caught a lot of people off guard. Uh, he certainly caught a, a lot of our allies off guard as well. The president suggesting that, that you know, keeping troops uh, in, in Iraq to monitor and maintain pressure on neighboring Iran. I think e even the interviewer, we saw there saying, wait a second, that would be some news. Um, so this is still sort of ricocheting around Washington. And what does it mean for sort of the broader strategy? If there is a really broad, broader strategy here, what message is that telegraphing? It's not clear that there is a broader strategy. <laughs> but let's listen to the president in his own words talk talking about now keeping troops in Iraq to keep eyes on Iran. Here he is. Well, we, we spent a fortune yeah. on building this incredible base. We might as well keep it. And one of the reasons I want to keep it is because I want to be looking a little bit at Iran, because Iran is a real problem. Well, and that's news. You're keeping troops in Iraq because you want to be able to strike in Iran? No, because I want to be able to watch Iran. All I want to do is be able to watch. We have an unbelievable an expensive military base built in Iraq. It's perfectly situated for looking at all over different parts of the troubled Middle East. The fear there, of course, right, is that this sort of undercuts these delicate negotiations that are going on in Iraq, of course, just as the president is trying to pull troops out of Syria and elsewhere in the region, you know, how does this balancing act play? Yeah, and, and how is the Pentagon digesting yeah. this? One wonders <laughs> if they've been informed of this as well. In fact, our Louis Martinez joins us. He's over at the Pentagon, uh, been talking to uh, Defense Department officials today. Louis, uh, how was this received there? And, 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 and give us the sense of the reaction around the world. I understand we're also hearing from some Iraqi officials in response to the president, too. Well, the response from the Iraqi officials is kind of surprised. They're saying that the president of the United States has not approached them about keeping United States troops inside Iraq uh, focused on watching Iran. Uh, if anything, what has been going on between the United States and Iraq is talk of keeping additional U.S. troops inside Iraq focused on Syria. Uh, you heard the president talk or say in that interview that some of the U.S. troops that were pulling out of Syria, they might be kept inside Iraq so that they can conduct operations inside of Syria. That is not a surprise. That is something that has been anticipated for quite some time because the United States military wants to keep an eye on what's going on on ISIS inside Syria so that they don't resurge again and become a threat, uh, not just overseas, but actually inside of uh, Syria. Now, w when we talk to military officials here today, um, I think the idea is that they would agree with the president that it's a good idea to keep U.S. forces 
uh, inside Iraq to maintain an area of focus on Syria. But when you bring up Iran, that's a totally different matter. What they're going to say is that that is a matter of policy uh, because the president is the one that decides whether, uh, you know, what the purpose of U.S. forces is going to be in that country. But again, let's not remember, let's not forget the real people who are going to decide how many troops uh, or whether there should be additional troops inside of, of Iraq uh, focused on Iran is the Iraqi government. And so far, uh, the president's comments have not been received favorably at all. Yeah, and a lot of mixed messages from the president, too, as you know, talking about pulling out of Syria, pulling out of Afghanistan, wanting to retrench American forces, then talking about keeping them there. Uh, and, Louis, what's the latest on another deployment to the southern border? There had already been several thousand, but now you're learning many more on the way? That's right. We're, the number of uh, forces, active duty troops that are on the southwest border right now is 23, 2,350. Over the weekend, the Pentagon announcing that an additional 3,750 are going to be going there. If you do the math, you think that's going to get you to 6,000, but actually what's going to happen is as some of these troops come in, other troops are going to be going out. So ultimately what we're going to end up with is about 4,300 uh, U.S. active duty troops along the border, and that's because they're shifting in mission. Uh, initially, they had been there to construct some projects. Uh, so uh, the laying down of concertina wire, um, so building up some uh, some security uh, areas along ports of entry. Uh, that mission was concluded a while ago. That's why you saw the troop reduction. Now what they're going to be doing, they're going to be enhancing the monitoring, uh, the surveillance, the intelligence gathering that's going to be carrying out there along the border on behalf of Customs and Border Protection. And they're also going to be additional construction teams going down to lay 150 miles of concertina wire along the border. Once that mission is completed, they'll go home, and then we're going to have this enduring mission through September now. It's possible it could be extended beyond that, because this mission has already been extended twice. But as of right now, on the books, it says this mission is going to last through September, and it looks like maybe we'll be in the 4,000 range uh, through that time. And I, I suspect we'll hear much more about that tomorrow night at the State of the Union Address. Louis, mm -hmm. thanks so much for your reporting. We'll be back with you this week, I'm sure. Mary, uh, in addition to these troop deployments, border security, Let's talk about a shutdown. The yeah. president mentioned that. He was teasing again yesterday in that interview that he hasn't taken it off the table. It is hard to believe, but the uh, what feels like never-ending Groundhog Day on the Hill, we could be right back where we were just a few weeks ago, the president leaving open the door that he could shut down the government again. Now, now some think that, that moving more troops to the border may be part of him trying to boost the argument to declare that national emergency that he's also still leaving on the table, the possibility that he could just go around Congress uh, and, and, and provide that funding uh, for the border wall on his own. It really is remarkable. There's been one meeting so far on the Hill uh, of this conference, the group of lawmakers from both chambers trying to get together, hammer out some kind of deal. But, you know, we watched that meeting closely, and it was a lot of talk, not a lot of what appeared to be real heartfelt negotiations. Both sides are still where they have been for the past several weeks. Democrats do not want to give the president that wall. The president insisting he's going to get that wall. And then they went away for a five-day weekend, and yeah. they are back tomorrow. They won't get a lot done then. So what we'll, we will see, remember that February 15th deadline is, is coming up fast. Really quickly. <laughs> uh, and that is when that funding runs out. So we'll see if the president has anything to say about the shutdown tomorrow as well. Speaking of the president and his planning uh, for the State of the Union address and other official business, we got a pretty interesting leak uh, to Axios overnight. Some White House official has revealed the president's private schedules for the last three months. Uh, it's digest that for a second. Really it's quite something. Remarkable. You've I mean, covered the White House, Mary. You know that these are quite a big tranche of documents. Yeah, and what's most most interesting about this, you know, there's a lot of, of, of eyebrows being raised about the amount of time that the president is spending in executive time. But what's really remarkable, I think you and I have been talking this morning, is the fact that you have someone who's so clearly on the inside, who has access to these schedules, who seems to be leaking them with the sole purpose essentially of embarrassing the president and his administration. We know how this administration feels about leaks. Uh, I suspect the White House is none too pleased about We also this know that the president does spend a lot of time in so-called executive time. You just saw a graphic there. What's new, though, according to Axios, they crunch the numbers. It's about 60 yeah. percent of the president's day is so-called executive time. Let's bring in our White House reporter, Jordan Phelps, uh, who's been asking around uh, uh, to this morning over there about uh, about that report. Jordan, can you break it down for everybody. What is executive time? What goes time? on yeah, during what, this what time? What goes on? What does he do? 
So that's the thing that's a little misleading maybe about this report is we know that executive time is the president's time, right? But that doesn't mean that the president is doing nothing during that time. It just means that we, the public, don't have insight into what the president is doing. Now, I should note that that is time when he does not have structured meetings. Uh, so I, it could be argued, as this uh, report sort of lays out, that it's questionable that 60 percent of the president's time is uh, sort of freewheeling. But it it really lines up with the President Trump that we know. Uh, and Sarah Sanders issued a statement to that Axios report, and she kind of uh, defended this amount of executive time, pointing out that it's allowed for a more creative environment uh, that's kind of goes in line with the way this president operates. Um, sort of an interesting defense, but. Devin, one other point, Kellyanne Conway says that this isn't the highest level of schedule. Uh, there actually is a, a more secretive schedule that a smaller group of people here at the White House get. The one that was leaked to Axios three months worth of schedules uh, goes out to a group of about 400 people within the White House, according to Kellyanne Conway. So there is a much more detailed micro schedule of the president's time uh, that she says is more accurate of what the president does. We also heard from the president's secretary uh, saying that this report is just a gross misrepresentation of the work that the president does every day for the American people. So it might be listed there as an executive time, but the White House is saying that it's executive time, but the president is at work during that time. And it is true, uh, mm -hmm. Mary, having covered the Obama administration, that President Obama spent a fair amount of executive time. It was just later in the day. He stayed up till yeah. 2 in the morning watching TV, catching up on correspondence. What it, what's interesting is most people sort of begin their work days at yeah. 8, 9 in the morning. This president doesn't get in till what, 11, 11, 11 30, 12? 12. 12. But, but we have been hearing from some of the, those closest to the president that say, look, this is the time when he's working the phones, when he's calling a lot of those in his inner circle to, to sort of discuss uh, what's on his agenda, how things are playing out. We know. You know you know, if you look at his Twitter feed, it does seem that he does spend a fair amount of that time also monitoring the cables, keeping an eye on some of his favorite shows. But but that time could be used for an, a, a number of things. So, so I think we have to be clear that executive time isn't just, you know, that's not free time. A fascinating revelation, but we should button this up with Jordan Phelps, the fact that this is quite a significant leak, not from some of those old rivals that sort of populated the West Wing that the president has had to purge over the last two years, but a relatively recent leak. Um, could this perhaps have anything to do with the departure of John Kelly, who is such an enforcer of the no cell phone policy, uh, close, uh, you know, close control of the Oval Office, for example? What, what sense are you getting about how this came out? Yeah, Devin, and, and we should note that leaks, of course, have been coming out from this administration since the beginning. Uh, it's true that it was more leaky, if you will, at the beginning, but uh, that certainly hasn't stopped. Uh, of course, a remarkable uh, leak for someone who is a loyalist, uh, presumably, to the president to put this information out there, and it's it's highly embarrassing to the White House and the president. Uh, but, Devin, uh, there is a change afoot here at the White House with the acting chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, now in charge. Uh, he has said that, you know, he's not here to control the president. Uh, he's here to control the staff here. Uh, so there is a different type of leadership here, and, and that may uh, be what's going on here. All right, Jordan Phelps for us at the White House. Thank you so much, Jordan. And we will kick our show today uh, with a look back at the Super Bowl and one of the ads that had a lot of people talking, this one from the Washington Post. I don't know if you caught it. Democracy Dies in Darkness was the name of the ad. We'll get Mary's insight on it right after we watch it right here. When we go off to war, when we exercise our rights, when we soar, to our greatest heights when we mourn and pray. When our neighbors are at risk, when our nation is threatened, there's someone to gather the facts, to bring you the story, no matter the cost. Because knowing empowers us. Knowing helps us decide. Knowing keeps us free.
so an ad for the Washington Post, but also very much a defense of journalism in a time yeah. when it's very much under fire and the loss of, uh, of those three fine journalists there um, been very much top of mind as it's well. It's pretty remarkable to see a newspaper advertising alongside those big beer <laughs> commercials, those big car commercials that, that, that yeah, usually gain so much attention. Remember when everyone thought that the newspapers were a thing of the past and now you have them up there side yeah, by side I mean, by the, all those, those major those, players? Those spots, I mean, this TV ad cost at least, I think Ooh. I saw an estimate, $5 million. Think of the journalists yeah. you could hire for $5 million. <laughs> so there's there's but, a little bit of blowback online about that. They could do, Post could have spent mm -hmm. that money, but, but I do think. Such a powerful message, though. Very I mean, powerful, if yeah. you're defending what all those journalists are doing, what, what I think all of us here are proud to do every day, it's a pretty remarkable. Yeah, message. at a time when there's declining trust in the mm -hmm. news media, it's certainly a reminder that a lot of journalists do a lot of really good work. Uh, and we appreci appreciate you following us here at ABC News and ABC News Live and the briefing room. We're here every day at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can watch us on all the ABC News digital platforms, abcnews.com, of course, the ABC News app. Download it uh, if you don't have it. Great to have Mary Bruce with us here Good on this here. Monday. We'll be back here tomorrow. Special coverage of the State of the Union address here on ABC News Live all Tuesday night starting 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. We'll see you tomorrow.